Okay, there we go. All right, my name is Shankar Narayan. I am the Technology and Liberty Project Director for the ACLU of Washington, and it is awesome to see all of you Linux festers here. I assume that means that you either really hate the surveillance state or you really love the ACLU or both. <laughs> I'm hoping it's both. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is, is talk, I'm going to talk through a little bit uh, kind of the where things stand in terms of surveillance and privacy in the Trump era. Uh, what we've seen change, uh, some of the specific kinds of collection that are <laughs> happening not just by the federal government but by local governments as well. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll speak for about half the time and then uh, just open it up for questions. In the other half. Before you get too deep into it, what do you define as the Trump era? Uh, now, since uh, since inauguration. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in case in case folks have been under a rock, uh, uh, the ACLU is the largest and the oldest civil liberties organization in the country, right? So, anything in the Constitution is basically fair game for us. Uh, we have stood up for justice uh, amid some of the most controversial periods in American history. Uh, fun fact, we appear in front of the Supreme Court more than any other organization except the government itself, the, the Department of Justice. Uh, you know, we, we fought the Palmer raids back in the 1920s when uh, the AG at the time was trying to go after uh, uh, politically radical immigrants. Right, we uh, we fought the Scopes case. We fought the internment of Japanese Americans. Uh, any free speech case that that you have heard of, it's likely that we were engaged with. Uh, Miranda, the right to remain silent. Griswold, the right to contraception. Loving, the right of interracial couples to marry. Uh, Gideon, uh, you're actually supposed to get a court-appointed attorney. Uh, that that right is is unfortunately uh, under attack. Uh, and of course, after 9-11, we also fought back against the suspicionless and warrantless dragnet surveillance that was happening and that was targeted at particular communities. Uh, so of course, there's themes here, right? And there are themes that, that sort of tend to come back again and again. Uh, and every generation uh, has to fight to, to protect those rights. And every generation within the ACLU has also done so. Uh, here in Washington, uh, you know, we have a really interesting mix of sort of uh, progressive politics and libertarian pro politics that actually allows us to uh, form these left-right coalitions that, that can actually push the envelope and become a model for uh, things in other states. So here, as you know, you know, we're one of the state first states to approve marriage equality at the ballot box. Uh, we did marijuana legalization. Uh, automatic restoration of voting rights for people coming out of the criminal justice system. Um, so, you know, we're hoping to continue to to keep Washington as a leader uh, around civil liberties issues, even when they're under attack at the uh, at the federal level. Uh, and of course, you know, a lot of the work we do is defensive as well. Uh, prior to becoming the Tech and Liberty uh, Project Director, I was our legislative director for uh, a decade and. Let me tell you, in a decade in Olympia, you, you really realize that there are a lot of lawmakers who don't necessarily read the Constitution before they introduce <laughs> legislation. Uh, you really wish they had, uh, because then you wouldn't have to spend time trying to kill that legislation. But it is, I think, uh, really true that we would be living in a different state if it weren't for uh, the work of the ACLU. Now, my job is work on freedom from intrusive government surveillance and protecting privacy, right? And so just to kind of lay the groundwork before we get to specifics around surveillance, I want to kind of tell you some of the premises from which I do my job, all right? So we don't accept the premise that you should have to choose between safety and your constitutional rights, right? There's often these things are presented as being in tension with each other. You can either have public safety or you can have civil liberties, you can't have both. Well, actually, we think you can. And the way you do that is you actually have a rational public debate around whether the impact of a particular surveillance technology or a particular way of protecting public safety uh, is actually worth the cost in terms of how it chills uh, civil liberties. 
Uh, and that also means that we don't accept the premise that you can simply say something is an issue of national security or terrorism and then operate above the Constitution with no checks and balances, right? In fact, we need those checks and balances more than ever uh, at a time when uh, uh, these issues are, are so front and center for us. Uh, and we also don't accept the premise that uh, in this digital age, people don't care about their privacy, right? You hear about that a lot, that, hey, you know, people have just given up, everyone's got a smartphone, everyone's gathering data, what's the big deal, right? Uh, it actually seems to be the case that when you give people options about their privacy, they tend to choose the more privacy protective options. Uh, I think the challenge that we have is that people feel like they don't have options and transparency and they don't have the ability to protect their privacy. It's not that they don't care about privacy, uh, period. Um, so who, who here cares about their privacy? And who here thinks they have enough information and choices to protect their privacy? You got one and a half hands on that one. Uh, okay, so you see the problem. Uh, indiscriminate surveillance, uh, our, my next premise is indiscriminate surveillance actually has a cost, right? So very often what happens is a piece of surveillance technology may be subsidized by uh, a vendor or by the federal government and may be aggressively marketed. And what happens is uh, that local jurisdiction that, that is considering the technology says, let's just get it, right? It's so cheap or it's free. We're going to put it in place. We are just going to see what happens. We're going to see if it does anything. Uh, that's not a very good approach because, of course, uh, constitutionally protected activities like free speech, your ability to engage in protests, your ability to go to a mosque, engage in religious practice, uh, those things can be chilled by living in a surveillance state. And we are, we are, we are seeing that. Uh, surveillance has always been targeted right, against uh, disproportionately against activists and against people in communities of color from Martin Luther King to W.E.B. Du Bois and now to Black Lives Matter and the Freddie Gray protesters who were targeted by a social media monitoring systems, right? Uh, you see that uh, there's a historic pattern here as well. Uh, the last premise that I'm going to put out there is that technology changes the game, right? And this is probably not a new one for folks in this audience, but uh, this is not a binary between being a Luddite, right, and say no technology versus adopting and embracing the surveillance state, right? There is, there is somewhere in between that actually puts uh, uh, safeguards and has a public debate over how particular measures should be taken uh, to, to protect public safety and where we want to draw the line, in part informed by our values of the kind of society we are. And of course, Washington, as you probably know, has one of the most uh, privacy protective constitutions in the country. Uh, you know, as a Western state, we, we do sort of have a libertarian ethos running toward uh, through us as well. So, so those, those are elements in, in how we should have this debate around uh, public safety and civil liberties. So what has happened in, in the Trump era, right? So I think one thing that you can say is that the stakes have gone up around all surveillance, right? Whether it's federal, state, or local. Uh, and to some extent, this was actually true before, uh, before the, the Trump era, right? There was increasing information sharing between local jurisdictions and states and the federal government. In Washington, that happens through these institutions that you probably are aware of called the fusion centers, right? There's five local ones. They feed up into a statewide one that's in Seattle, and that feeds up into uh, a federal system from which it's very, very difficult to bring data back. So in effect, once something is collected at the local level uh, and it gets hoovered up in the, into the system, it's very, very difficult to get away from. That's a challenge, and it means that uh, we need to be even more careful at the local level where we have more leverage than, than at the federal level to, to really, really think through how we're collecting information, what we're collecting, why we're collecting it, and really rely on this principle that if you don't need to collect it, don't collect it, you know, have it only be used for a particular purpose, articulate that purpose, make the data go away uh, when that purpose is done. 
Uh, the Trump administration, as we, as you've probably seen, is likely to be more aggressive on surveillance. I think you know the executive orders that we've seen from the Muslim exclusion order to uh, the attempt to build a border wall are really just the start. Uh, there will be increased funding for border surveillance as well, right? So you've heard talk of building the physical wall that's slowly morphing into building a virtual wall, right? And so a couple of weeks ago, there was a border expo down south. I think it was in Phoenix. And, uh, you know, it was quite terrifying because there are all of these vendors, right, basically not only marketing uh, these various modes of collection, but also uh, marketing what they, what they are trying to do with the data on the back end, which is essentially to feed it into uh, uh, artificial intelligence tools, right, machine learning tools, that then uh, the, the ultimate goal is, is to be able to actually predict people's behavior based on how they present, right, and this combines with facial recognition and other tools uh, to create a society that, that, you know, folks had warned us about, uh, you know, decades and decades ago, right, it looks a lot like 1984, uh, and people do tend to think that this stuff is a long way out. It's really not as far out as, as you think. Uh, and we know that, of course, a panoply of tools have specifically been deployed at the border. You know, for a, a community no, near the border like Bellingham, this is probably of particular concern, right? But, you know, everything from drones to body cameras to infrared devices uh, to heliostats to facial recognition, right? All of that uh, has already been deployed at the border. This isn't even counting the new stuff that uh, some of the, $54 billion increase in military spending in the, mu in the new budget is, is likely to go to. Uh, and, and you will also see more aggressive tactics, right? So one of the things we saw in the aftermath of the, the Muslim exclusion order was that CBP, uh, Customs and Border Protection, for the first time, well, not, not for the first time, but certainly on a more consistent basis, was uh, uh, asking ideological questions at the border, right? So theoretically, uh, you know, that, that is not a question that's supposed to matter, right? It's the level of threat you pose, not necessarily the ideology you hold. Uh, and yet there, there's much more aggressive pursuit of, uh, of, of those questions. And it certainly, although I think it's too early to say if there, there's a real pattern there, it certainly seems to us that we're getting more complaints about people being aggressively questioned about their ideology um, at the border. And of course, this leads to the question of device searches as well, right? So uh, CBP claims the authority to essentially search your device at the border. Uh, and even though the Constitution and the Supreme Court have agreed that someone under arrest, uh, they need a warrant to search their phone, uh, CBP claims that that same protection does not apply at the border. So uh, that's, that's also a change that, that, uh, that we have seen. Uh, and co compounding that is the fact that compliance is a very, very difficult thing to obtain as well, right? So uh, one of the challenges we've seen in the, in the Trump era is that there's really not a lot of consistency around how the agency is enforcing even between different border checkpoints, right? So we hear different things happening up here, right, at Peace Arch versus down on the southern border. Uh, they have been very secretive also about uh, allowing us to get at their policies, right? So uh, we, for example, as ACLU, uh, did a 50-state uh, public disclosure request, a FOIA request to Customs and Border Protection just saying, hey, what's the policy here, right? Do you, what, are you, what are you actually trying to enforce across these various border checkpoints? Uh, and that was basically blanket denied, so it looks likely to go into a full-blown lawsuit. Uh, and, and that's a challenge, because if you don't know what the policies are, it's very, very difficult to, to know if this is one individual rogue officer breaking policy or if it's just an entire policy <laughs> of invasive questioning based on ideology. Uh, so you know, I, I'm going to sort of move quickly through some of these, some of these other basics, right, uh, around uh, uh, how surveillance technologies change the game. There, I think what I'll say about that particular piece is that 
there are many new and specific modes of collection, and so the government watches you remotely, right? And this is not just at the border, but away from the border. You know, there's a whole list. So drones, still cameras, body cameras, mesh network devices, CCTVs, automated license plate readers, which are on you know, many, many uh, cop cars. They're on the, the light bars, right, of the cruisers, and these are devices that hoover up every license plate of every car, not only go, you know, driving along in the same direction, but also in the opposite direction and also parked, right? And by and large, the stuff just goes into databases with no restrictions over how it's, how it's used, right? It's a, it's a massive location database of, you know, everybody who drives in Washington, again, without a warrant and available to anybody who, who cares to, to get it publicly disclosed. Um, things like cell site simulator devices, right? So uh, people have heard about stingrays, right? So, uh, or, or dirt boxes. Uh, they they uh, are basically devices that will connect to your cell phone by tricking your cell phone into thinking that they are a cell tower. Uh, and though, although their capabilities are disputed and, and one of the lawsuits we're currently fighting is actually to try to get more transparency around the capabilities of the technology and how it's being deployed, uh, there are really not a lot of rules, right, in terms of how that specific uh, technology uh, could be used by law enforcement. Uh, and, and really that illustrates the challenge, right, because we haven't had the public debate about what values should, should aid the deployment of that technology. Uh, of course, uh, these specific points of collection are only a part of the problem because we live in a society where we all hemorrhage this trail of digital debris, right? Everywhere we go, uh, you carry your cell phone around, right? You use apps, you drive your car, which is now more of a computer than a car. You use your key card at work. You use uh, a video system at home or you have a smart home right? You, you log into your computer, you use the internet, uh, the internet of things, right? Echo and uh, uh, various other smart home devices, right? Those things aren't just there to, to, to make you happy, they're actually there to convey the details of your life back to, back to the mothership, in case you weren't, <laughs> in case you weren't aware of that. Uh, and <laughs> these granular surveillance capabilities you know, go back to these companies that, you know, they, they uh, certainly aren't telling you this, but they are in the business of data brokering as well, right, and can sell that information, and they can sell it to the government as well, right? So we don't necessarily have uh, uh, rules around what this massive amount of fine-grained data uh, uh, is for and what can be done with it. Uh, Certainly the corporations want to monetize and sell it, but the government may want to use it for uh, more challenging purposes. Uh, and of course, with analytics, right, part of the, the, the premise there is that you can use analytics to uh, re-identify data sets, even data sets that have been anonymized, right? So the more data is out there about you, right, the, the less need for it uh, uh, there is for any individual piece of data to be identified with you because the whole in combination identifies you. Uh, so it means that even data that you've taken steps to keep private uh, may, uh, may end up uh, being identified with you. Uh, and you get to a place perhaps where the individual modes of collection are, are, are less necessary because you're hemorrhaging data in your life in so many, in so many different ways. Uh, I think a corollary challenge as well to, to all of these points of collection is uh, when you look at it from the law enforcement context, it ends up taking officers off the street because it, there's a tendency to, to want to just put the officers in a room with, with watching the screens that are connected to the cameras that are watching everyone. That is not a particularly good way of, of doing policing because of course what it does is take off the table, the relationships and the community policing aspect that we know is, is really critical in maintaining uh, public safety. So, to give you a few examples of, of who's collecting information now, Right, so I usually take the example of Seattle Police Department because they're the one that I've 
I've worked <laughs> with and against most. Uh, you know, our, our ACLU office is based down in Seattle. And over the past few years, Seattle Police Department has acquired drones, video and audio based gunshot locator technologies, facial recognition technology, and social media monitoring systems. And they've done all of this without a single bit of public debate. Uh, and as I mentioned, right, local surveillance now is effectively federal surveillance, which means that uh, this data, if the feds really want to come and get it, uh, it's, it's very difficult to pull it back or, or, to, or to correct it. Uh, state agencies surveil as well, right? So we recently did uh, a, a, a statewide public disclosure request around social media monitoring systems. Uh, you all may be familiar, they sort of hit the headlines a few months ago in Seattle when it was revealed that Seattle Police Department had acquired Geofedia. So these are basically tools that allow uh, both aggregation and analytics of social media posts. Uh, and because they are uh, uh, looking at so many more posts, right, they're able to draw inferences about you from those posts in a very different way from a, a single officer just trolling web pages on, on the web, right? Uh, so they acquired the, the social media monitoring systems. There was, there was a big flap because, in fact, there was not a single word about how uh, SMMS was supposed to be used uh, by, by Seattle Police Department, right? It, it would be very different if they said, we are only going to use it when there's a Seahawks game, right? And, and we want to uh, geofence that perimeter. Uh, so I'll take questions at the end. Uh, we want to geofence that perimeter versus we want to be able to uh, uh, geofence a mosque and monitor communications coming in and out. That is, in fact, a real example. SPD did tell me that they, they wanted to geofence a mosque, right? And so you can imagine the impact on civil liberties uh, and free speech from people who may not want to go to that place of worship anymore. Very similar to what happened in New York where uh, there the tool was automated license plate readers where they were using ALPR to track people who were coming in and out of uh, a particular mosque. Uh, and this, this tool has become, uh, I think, uh, uh, commonly used in Washington state. There are about 15 police departments and actually at least one school district that's using SMMS on the students. Uh, and uh, at the state level, the Washington State Fusion Center itself is also using uh, social media monitoring systems to, to do its own uh, uh, surveillance. Uh, the Washington State Patrol uh, has, has for a while had uh, uh, aircraft that have uh, you know, FLIR infrared cameras also not clear if they use stingrays, uh, that, that's a possibility. Uh, you all know, so I don't need to delve into the federal government's uh, surveillance. You know, you've, you've read about the Snowden revelations. Uh, you may have read that recently the government stopped the about collection that, that was the subject of great controversy. Uh, less noticed in that, in that uh, sort of news item was that they also broadened their ability to search other downstream uh, uh, troves of data that were collected about, incidentally collected about Americans, right? So uh, some privacy was, was, was given with one hand, but privacy was taken away with, with the other hand. Uh, and information sharing at the federal level under the Trump administration has also uh, increased. Uh, one example is that, you know, the NSA uh, gained the power recently to share data with other agencies unfiltered. Uh, and federal agencies, uh, a number of them are claiming to be working on uh, uh, improving centralization of data, which, which is you know, a tenant of this administration. Uh, and you may have known, uh, noticed in the, in the headlines as well that one of President Trump's executive orders uh, stripped non-citizens of Privacy Act protections, which basically means that any database that contains both information of citizens and non-citizens uh, uh, they're saying that the non-citizens information in that database now loses Privacy Act protections and can be shared more freely. Uh, that's not a very good idea 
purely even purely for liability reasons because uh, you know under federal statute if you have privacy protections you're supposed to go through this whole uh, evaluation you know privacy impact assessment of every single record that you're stripping protections from uh, and by the way this may also endanger uh, uh, American cooperation with Europe because privacy shield is something that protects European uh, uh, citizens whose information may be in American databases. Um, so that's just what, you know, and this was a line in an executive order. It was buried at, you know, item 15 or 16, and yet has this massive potential impact on, on privacy. One trend that also predated the Trump administration, uh, but we think is likely to accelerate, is the collaboration between local law enforcement uh, and immigration enforcement, right? So uh, you've heard of maybe 287G agreements, which are agreements deputizing local law enforcement to enforce immigration law. We haven't seen any in Washington, uh, but we do know that there's a policy at the federal level of trying to uh, trying to shop these agreements around, so we have also kind of preemptively uh, fired off letters to all of our major police departments saying this is not a good idea and it could get you sued. Uh, you know, we, we actually think that there's unconstitutional aspects to it. Uh, they are trying to shame sanctuary cities as well, right, or welcoming cities first by publishing a list of. of uh, you know, all, all jurisdictions that didn't honor immigration detainers for particular immigrants. Uh, we think there's constitutional problems with all of that, right? The Supremacy Clause does say that federal law conta uh, controls over state law, but the feds uh, under the 11th Amendment also cannot commandeer the mechanism of the state to do what is essentially a federal job, which is immigration enforcement. Uh, so again, you know, it goes back to in this era, a good offense at the local level is really our best defense, right? We have the ability to put protections in place. Uh, and, you know, they may result in litigation, right? I think there will be some efforts to, to, to try to force localities uh, by using federal money to, to, to try to uh, enforce immigration law or at least cooperate and share information. Uh, but we also, you know, thus far have a pretty good record of litigation in the in the Trump era. We've we've won just about everything that that we filed, um, so that's that's a very good sign. Uh, so searches, uh, briefly, I'll talk about, uh, you know, people coming across the border, but also this expanded <coughs> this expanded authority in border areas. Uh, so CBP basically claims that the border extends 100 miles inland. Uh, I'm fairly certain that we are there. Uh, that also includes uh, sea borders, right? So, so it ends up being a zone that two-thirds of the U.S. population uh, lives in. And we actually dispute that CBP has this unchecked authority to, to exercise search powers without constitutional procedure in that zone. Uh, and I think we, we expect fully at some point, you know, in the next four years that that's going to be uh, tested and we'll probably reach, uh, we'll probably reach the Supreme Court. Uh, then there is just hiring, right, of, of Border Patrol agents, right? So they are, they are instituting this much larger hiring uh, acceleration. We just met with CBP to talk about what that looks like. And I think part of the challenge is they're having problems finding adequately uh, qualified individuals, right? And so that is resulting in them actually waiving parts of the requirements of the test just so they can get people in more quickly. Uh, that is not good news, particularly because even with the level of training they already have, we have seen agents coming up from the southern border. Uh, you know, the northern border, particularly the Olympic Peninsula, has been overstaffed, and that's resulted in, you know, people who really got into the job because they were looking for, you know, action, right, like a, a much more interesting job, uh, then going and seeking out their own action, unfortunately, occasionally involving racial profiling by, uh, you know, looking to pick up people who are dropping off their kids or in, in the lots of churches. Or as you've heard as well, there's now ICE uh, courthouse enforcement, uh, which, which is a topic of a lot of, uh, of controversy. So where I will end, and, and you know, I, I'm, 
I, I want this to be interactive, so we'll have half this time for questions. And if there are particular technologies that, that you know, you're interested in hearing about, I'm happy to go uh, more into depth about them. But I'll end on this, this note of, well, you know, what do we do, right? Uh, Congress is in gridlock. We can't expect much there. The federal administration, uh, you know, indications are that, that they, uh, you know, may try to ignore the rule of law in some instances and we'll have to use the courts as a backstop to try to hold them accountable. Uh, but again, I think local and state legislatures are really the place to go because they can anticipate problems around surveillance. Uh, they can put in place regimes of accountability and transparency around each piece of surveillance technology. Um, so in Seattle, for example, we have something called the Seattle Surveillance Ordinance that we are trying to get updated now, right? And the idea is that the jurisdiction needs to do, the agency that wants to acquire a piece of surveillance technology needs to do some basic homework around what that looks like, right? To ask and answer the basic question, what is this technology for? Right? What benefit do we actually think this technology is going to get us? Is it actually effective right, in, in achieving that purpose? And if it is, how do we know? Right? Is there data? Are there studies? Who else has used it? Right? Getting, getting a body of evidence in place that shows that it actually works. And that's even before you look at the cost of the technology, both in terms of dollars and in terms of the, the chilling impact on, on civil liberties. Uh, but the most important aspect is really to get this data in front of the public so that there's some opportunity for public input. What you don't want to do is what Seattle did with drones, which is they just bought two of them. And when the public asked, uh, you know, what are these for and what are your policies, they said, hey, we'll do a demonstration and fly them around for you and see how cool they are, right? It didn't work very well in Seattle. What ended up is the public outrage around the drones escalated and escalated because, you know, let's face it, you know, this isn't true of every technology, but drones definitely creep people out, right? And so they eventually had to pull the plug on the program and they sold them to some unfortunate police department in, in California, which is probably having the same problems now, right? Uh, so that's what you don't want to do. What you do want to do is have a robust public debate. Uh, and then, you know, there may well be uses of the, te the, uh, the technology that are okay, but you want to articulate what those are and have an audit trail that shows that the agency is in compliance as well as third parties that are watching the watchers so that you know the system's not being abused. Um, so that's, that's what you do at the local level. Olympia, there's ways to get involved there as well. You know, the, the broadband privacy bill that, that is actually still alive in special session is a, is a good example where they're trying to backstop and replace the rules of the FCC around broadband privacy that didn't go into effect. Uh, and the ISPs, these internet service providers, have, have lobbied really, really hard against uh, having any restriction on their ability to sell your private browsing history, right? And this also matters because one of the purchasers of that private browsing history can be the government, right? And in the brave new world that we're moving towards, what it essentially means is every piece of data that, that's out there, right, is fed into machine learning systems that d don't even necessarily need to identify you, right, because they're identifying your characteristics and you are being compared against a profile to determine what you are going to do in the future. It starts to look a lot like Minority Report. Uh, it, is, it is quite frightening, and one thing that's enabling it is this massive uh, uh, infusion of, of, uh, of information, uh, including from things like body camera systems, right? Taser is actually selling, they, they are giving away their police body cameras so they can get the data into the back end, feed it into machine learning systems, and develop policing systems that are predictive, right? Based on facial recognition, when you're walking towards me, right? How you're walking towards me might indicate right to the system whether or not I'm going to pose a threat to the officer, right? Of course, these systems are all biased, right? It's not transparent. And so one thing we can do, you know, at, at, at 
our level, the local and state level, is to, to really tighten the spigot on how data gets out in the first place because we can't really predict down the line how that data, how that data is going to be used. Uh, so there's about half an hour left for questions. I'm going to stop there and uh, open it up to you all. What do you want to hear about? Yes, sir. Since we are half an hour from the border, how intense is the scrutiny that we are under now? So the question was, uh, we're half an hour from the border. How intense is the scrutiny that, that we are under? Uh, you know, part of the problem is we don't, we don't have an answer to that. Right? It goes back to questions of transparency, right? We have done these public disclosure requests from Customs and Border Protection. And frankly, we don't even know the rules around how, for example, body cameras are being used by uh, uh, by Border Patrol. We believe they use social media monitoring systems as well, and certainly the Fusion Center does too, right? So uh, one answer is that the potential for anyone to be scrutinized by those systems exists. Uh, I think that we are going to, you know, and this is, this is pure speculation because we don't have uh, right uh, facts and data to back it up, but certainly from what I've heard from meeting with Customs and Border Protection, their intent is to up their presence even on the northern border. Uh, and part of that is going to be done by this technological infusion that includes social media monitoring, but it, it will also include a number of other sort of discrete technologies that, that collect information. Uh, now, if they do <coughs> decide, for example, that they're going to deploy, you know, camera systems on the streets of Bellingham, right? Then we would we would probably investigate and try to figure out if that's a Fourth Amendment violation. Uh, a, an analogous example is down in Seattle, right? These mysterious federal cameras appear, you know, on on light poles every once in a while, uh, and the feds basically say, look, these are always in connection with a specific investigation. Sorry, we can't tell you anymore. Uh, we have tried to go through the city council to actually say, we don't, you know, feds, we don't want you uh, putting your cameras on our property because it's not clear to me how they can simply just not even ask the city and stick a camera on, on a light pole. So again, we've tried to use local avenues of accountability to, to sort of slow the surveillance down. At the end of the day, though, it is a, it is a federal government issue and, and our best recourse is probably the Fourth Amendment and the courts. Yes, sir. When, in your opinion, is public law up to date with technology? That's a great question. You know, this, this actually came up in the previous ACLU and Friends panel. Uh, so there's, there's layers of law, right? The Constitution is really just a backstop, right? I think uh, uh, what we get a lot of in our debates around surveillance technology with law enforcement is law enforcement will say, well, you know, this is perfectly constitutional, right? There, there, there's nothing unconstitutional about this particular use of technology because it's just plain view. Uh, and that's not actually supported by Supreme Court juris jurisprudence, right? Even the Supreme Court has, has recognized that when you do things with technology and that technology makes uh, a particular action easier, cheaper, more ubiquitous, harder to detect, right? That actually changes the game such that the constitutional protections around it uh, look different. So a good example is the Jones case with uh, GPS tracking of vehicles, right? So, uh, you know, in California, a, a, a kid wakes up basically to find that a, a, a GPS tracker, which you know used to be these like large objects, had fallen off of his car. He had no idea what it was until... <laughs> that was not the government, that was just me. <laughs> he had no idea what it was until uh, federal agents showed up at his door to demand the G their GPS tracker back, right? And so the feds argued in court that, hey, look, we could have deployed an agent and followed this guy around in his car everywhere he drove, and that would have been you know, perfectly legal because it was in plain sight of everybody, and he had no expectation of privacy. What the court said was, no, that's not the case, because one officer could 
track a thousand vehicles just sitting in an office, right, if all of them had these GPS trackers. So I think there's some recognition from uh, the, the, the courts that technology changes the game. The problem is they're always lagging behind, right? And they are also not particularly well equipped. You know, let's face it, right? Like judges are not our most technologically savvy uh, uh, populace. And, you know, in my view, just as, you know, judges take the help of law clerks to help them write laws, right? They also should take the help of technologists to help them understand the technologies under scrutiny so they can write laws that actually gear, uh, or, or so they can make decisions under, under the Constitution that are actually geared to uh, 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 what the technology actually does. Now, I think that the other, the other problem there is that statutes also often are lagging behind, right? But all things considered, the legislature is really a better place because it's not constrained by the facts of a particular case in front of it. It can look holistically at the impact of a technology and try to make uh, a, a set of safeguards that, that, uh, that are appropriate for that technology. You can also just legislate the collection of kinds of information, right? So in Seattle, we have the Seattle Intelligence Ordinance, which basically offers protection for First Amendment protected activities like, you know, who you associate with, what religion you practice, whether you go to protests. Uh, and in Seattle, you can't collect that stuff unless there is some reasonable suspicion that criminal activity has or is about to occur. And this dates way back, right? This is, this is a law that was actually passed in the late 70s after Seattle police was tracking, tracking activists, right, and keeping dossiers on those activists. Uh, now we should be even more worried about that kind of thing because once the information again is in a local database, it will get shared and there's no, there's really no bounding uh, how it comes back. So that's an example of a local uh, statute that could be replicated. We've tried to have that replicated at the, at the, state, at the state level. So yeah, I think you can do things, uh, you know, via statute, uh, but what it really takes, I think, is legislators understanding that people are watching them, right? My experience in Olympia and even in a liberal place like Seattle is that law, you know, law enforcement exerts a lot of pressure and has a lot of influence on legislators, right? And legislators are really afraid, right? The, for them, the worst thing that could happen is, right, there's some terrorist incident on a street in Seattle and then people come back and unelect them because they say, well, you know, they didn't let the police use a particular technology. Uh, and we're really not saying don't use technology, we're saying put the safeguards around it in place and have the robust public debate. Whether that happens really depends on all of you, right? And I think what we've seen in our base is a real waking up where people are trying to get more engaged building relationships with their lawmakers, calling them more, and, and letting them know that there is, in fact, a group of people that wants uh, uh, their civil liberties and doesn't just think that every piece of surveillance technology should be deployed because it's there. In the corner. Um, you mentioned the Fourth Amendment. What does the Fourth Amendment actually say? What does the Fourth Amendment say? Uh, so, I mean, it's basically your protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, Washington has something called Article 1, Section 7, which uh, is even stronger than the Fourth Amendment in some instances. It's more privacy protective. Uh, you know, the, the problem with the Fourth Amendment is it basically ratchets down over time, right? It depends on people's reasonable expectations of privacy, but, you know, if, if you're living in a surveillance state and you don't expect very much privacy, that's not a very good protection, right? Uh, on the other hand, in Washington, that privacy protection is absolute. And we often use that to argue you know, against various kinds of digital searches. Uh, it's, really, it's really a fantastic law. Uh, and you know, I feel like we're very lucky to, to at least have that basis to argue in Washington. So on a personal level, um one of the big, really common things, bits of advice that I hear is use a VPN. But the question that I have with that is the problem with VPNs is that you're essentially trusting that the server you're talking to 
isn't also collecting your data and selling it off. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's difficult to impossible to roll your own. Uh, the company I work for offers a VPN server, and what a pretty common thing I have to tell them is that having connecting to a VPN on the same local network effectively does nothing. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what advice do you have for choosing a good VPN provider? None. <laughs> <laughs> but but I will say that you know, and, and in all seriousness, I think there are there are people. Who are uh, who are thinking about those questions much more seriously in the Trump era than they previously were? Even us, right? So, uh, you know, what we're doing is kind of developing three levels of, of self defense, right? One is, of course, just you know revisiting all of our IT infrastructure, but of course, because that's only as good as the weakest link that connects to it, we are also revamping our entire best practices for our individual attorneys right so that we you know we are as secure as we can possibly be and as part of that we're looking at the vpn question uh you know we're looking at various encryption tools i mean there's also a question of validation that's never going to go away right i think in some ways validation by public approval is the best you can do right there's always going to be some some uh, trust question there uh, the third level that that we're looking at is outward facing so we're basically uh, putting together a training that combines both surveillance, self-defense, and civil liberties kind of into one training that uh, is really geared towards people who are interested in exercising their freedom of speech, religion, association. Uh, and it starts, as you know, right, with, with kind of creating uh, what your own threat profile is, which is different for every person, and then adopting the tools that work best in your particular situation. So you may be in a very different place, right, and need a, uh, a different uh, uh, mechanism than, than some of the activists that I, that I talk to. Um, yeah. Um, I have a quick statement and then a question. Um, there's actually a project that is a Docker image with a VPN in it that you can just deploy anywhere and run it. So if you trust your host, or you can roll it off into your key exchange, it's probably safer than a corporate VPN. Um, and the question I had was, you mentioned you know judges aren't very tech savvy. Do you know of any organizations or um, anybody who's like doing workshops or something like try to educate judges about technology? Is that a thing? I mean, us. You know, we're so we're partnering with our uh, local. So we have an offshoot of EFF called ERR, Electronic Rights Rainier, right? So they, they're local. We're partnering with them on the uh, both the outward facing training. But one thing that we're doing as well is uh, talking to the Bar Association, right? So there is now this, I mean, you know, everything in the Bar Association takes like 12 years. So this started like two or three years ago, but there's uh, basically an update of the access to justice technology principles. And I think as part of that, we're pushing to try to get these trainings both to prosecutors, to, to defense attorneys, and to judges. Um, so I, you know, it may take some time, but but the the seed for that has been planted. Yeah. So the private party, the threat of a lawsuit would be a disincentive because I can lose time and money. So when the government or police departments are on the other end of that. They can't, they're not going to lose time or money, you can't take it away from an entity like that. So, is it, it's my perception that with them it would just be, let's do this until someone finds out about it and tells them to stop. Is there anything to do to get ahead of it? Say, you know what I'm saying? Is there a way to disincentivize it ahead of time? Because everything in the legal act, in the, you know, legally, is just going to be after the fact. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get any of that information. Is there, is there a forum somewhere to be able to present uh, disapproval, basically, to orders or anything? To right. Yeah. So, right. So, so, so the que the question is 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 there sort of uh, you know lawsuits are basically cure and not prevention. If I'm if I'm summarizing correctly, is there more of a cure based approach that allows you to get ahead of the problem? Uh, and I think that's exactly what we're trying to create, right? Like my experience has been that uh, we don't, we haven't had the public forums around privacy and surveillance, in part because lawmakers don't perceive that the public is demanding it, 
all right? And, and so we almost have this chicken and egg thing where these surveillance technologies are acquired, you know, almost under cover of darkness. I mean, you know, in Seattle even, they're just buried, you know, in, in, in budget provisos somewhere. Uh, there's not a single word of debate outside Seattle Police Department. Uh, and in fact, if we look at, you know, some of the, the public materials, the public disclosure materials we got around social media monitoring systems, it really is this driven by, as far as I can tell, the super aggressive monitoring by uh, these social media monitoring systems companies. In some cases, they were actually touting their ability to, to squash First Amendment protected activities, right? They were touting the fact that they were used against the Freddie Gray protesters in Baltimore, for example, right? And I think a lot of people probably would have been outraged had they known at the time that this is how Geophedia was, was operating, right? So I think for us, the, what, you know, goal number one, even before we start to look at specific pieces of technology, although we are doing that, is, is to create this public space and public forum uh, that allows a, a robust public debate and allows people who are concerned about surveillance to come in and say no, this doesn't work with our values. I think the other pressure point is also the companies themselves, right? They can be sensitive to pressure. You know, everything from, you know, we were actually able to get Geophedia cut off from direct access to uh, Twitter feeds uh, and Facebook uh, just because we highlighted the fact that they were uh, marketing based on squashing constitutionally protected activities. And you know, Facebook and Twitter were sensitive to the pressure that, that was being put on them by the users and they cut these guys off, right? So things like that, things like you know, Google, for example, uh, stopping its targeting of predatory lending ads to people of color, right, which they were doing. Uh, and they claimed it was based algorithmically, but you know, it didn't make it necessarily, why, why it was happening didn't necessarily make it any better. And again, in the face of exposing that problem and public pressure, the, the companies back down. Uh, you know, more broadly, I think at some point we need a code, right? A, a set of rules of the road around how algorithms are deployed and how machine learning is deployed. Uh, and there's, you know, there's just starting to, to coalesce kind of a brain trust around that to, to figure out what that, what that ends up looking like. Yes. Um, if there were a startup called Ray Peter, if there was a startup of a couple of people who could make a product, um, what would be the one thing that would help you, uh, your colleagues, the most? Like what's, what's the one really you know, serious pain point that just comes up every day for you guys, other than you know, tech pain? Boy, that is such a tough question. So, so on the private sector side, uh, Yeah, I mean, you know, one one thing that would be really interesting is a more real-time way to show people how much data they are hemorrhaging. And, you know, and, and so I've, I've sort of had this idea kind of floating around in my head. I have no idea if it's feasible, right? But, but one of the challenges of th this data hemorrhaging world is that you actually have no idea, right, uh, which piece of data it was that you hemorrhaged that has resulted now in this real world consequence, right? I'm suddenly getting charged more for a loan or, you know, this cop suddenly has me hands down on the, uh, you know, or face down on the pavement, right, handcuffing me and I have no idea. And, you know, it, it's algorithm and data driven, right? It's database, but I don't know why. So almost this ability to create a data map, right, of, of the data that people hemorrhage, right, and, and where it goes, right? An analogous to, you know, I think of those, uh, those little dye pills that people swallow that then sort of, uh, you know, color parts of their bloodstream, right, so you can track things as, as they go through. Uh, you know, that, that would be, a, I think, a really useful tool because our experience has been, you know, when you really illustrate the, the privacy the privacy impact in a in a tangible way for people they think about it differently uh, you know in Seattle we we actually PDR three years worth of uh, license plate reader data uh, and we had a volunteer uh, uh, 
from one of our local tech companies actually build us an internal demonstration tool where you could type in your license plate and you could see a heat map of everywhere. Like I typed in my license plate and bingo, right? There is like a heat map around my house, uh, you know, the coffee shop where I, where I drink coffee, the dog park where I walk my dog, my office, you know, my chiropractor. I mean, all of this stuff, you know, it was incredibly granular. And I was like, man, I didn't even think I drove that much, right? So, <laughs> so say that again. How did you get that data? So, well, public disclosure, it's all, it's all publicly disclosable. Um, so that's, that's the problem, right? ALPR is a technology where, which we actually, by the way, in Olympia attempted to regulate this year. Uh, and, and we actually got quite a long way down the path, but uh, law enforcement came back and, and uh, you know, I think more because of the political gridlock in Olympia around the budget this year, they were able to kill off the bill. We're gonna try again on that one and I think what we would like is limiting ALPR to a very limited set of uses and purging, right? Basically purging the entire data set within 48 hours, right? I think we, we really think, you know, the, the legitimate uses are, you know, way stations, right? And check against a hot list. Although frankly, even checking against a hot list of stolen vehicles for me personally might be a bridge too far. You know, I think that that one's probably not gonna go away, but but okay, right, if you're gonna use ALPRs, if there's no match to a stolen vehicle hot list, delete the data, right, it should go away. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the issues in Olympia. Um, I know that the Seattle Police Officers Guild is a lobbying group which gives money to politicians, um, such as uh, Mayor Murray. Uh, have you noticed any correlation between politicians who push back against you guys and donations they've taken from the Police Officers Guild or other police groups? You know, I, I mean, I don't know, honestly, that law enforcement needs to lobby with money. They tend to lobby with in, in the court of public opinion, right? And, and my experience in Olympia has been that the cops are some of the toughest people to go up against because, you know, there's almost no question or bill that you put in front of a legislator that they don't say, oh, I need to go check with my sheriff, right? Because the Democrats in particular really don't want to be labeled as soft on crime. Um, and, and they are really terrified that, that they could get outflanked that way. So, so yeah, they, they, you know, there's no doubt, particularly WASPIC, the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs, uh, and WACOPS, which is the Lion officers, have, have pretty outsized influence down in Olympia. SPOG right now uh, is actually doing us a favor by holding up the body camera policy. Uh, you know, but, but, uh, but they also, you know, I, I think, uh, the, the challenge is that they have stood in the way of meaningful regulations around some surveillance technologies by basically saying that they're a condition of, of working and need to be bargained. We don't think it can be the case, right, that, that just general substantive rules around how surveillance technologies are deployed should be a, a, a bargainable condition that, that has to go to the police union before it can even be voted on by legislators. So that's something we fought back against. No, I mean just the just the standard, right? So I mean, uh, I think I think it's something like seven years. I mean, so it's a lot of data, <laughs> you know, un under under the default. Yeah. Uh, from from my perspective, uh, looking back, you know, 15, 17 years, it, it seems that surveillance has only expanded. Have you noticed any uh, differences between political parties or prior administrations that have been more friendly? Yeah, that is a really interesting question. You know, uh, th th uh, this was my, so this was sort of my experience in Olympia and I was actually interested to see it. It was actually validated by a study, right? So under the Bush administration, it was the Democrats who were, who were crying foul about excessive government surveillance and the Republicans who were much more laissez-faire about it. Uh, and that flipped uh, under the Obama administration. So it became the Democrats who were basically like, you know, well, if you got nothing to hide, what's your problem? 
and the Republicans that, that you know, were, were sort of very gung-ho about getting the feds out of their business. And, and you know, so my, just about all of my lobbying career down in Olympia, you know, I mean, I, I started down there in, in like 05, 06, but I wasn't really working on these issues until 08. And so my experience down there was that the Republicans were actually some of our best friends on this. Uh, you know, and, and they really stuck to their guns on surveillance issues while, you know, very often it was, so to speak, uh, whereas, whereas very often, uh, uh, you know, it was, the, it was the Democrats, in fact, who ended up killing some really good bills. Uh, you know, for example, we sent a drone bill to Governor, we, we passed a drone bill in two consecutive years and Governor Inslee vetoed it. Right, and, and all we could tell is that he was afraid of, of Boeing, which also owns in situ, which is a drone manufacturer, uh, having a bad reaction, right? So you can kind of see that corporate dollars and corporate influence has, has some effect even you know, on, on, on both parties. Uh, and what you really need to do to get legislation through, as we did in the drone case, was, was build a bipartisan coalition. Burning, burning questions. Last burning question. So this one's not very burning, but do we have any data around hiring for ICE and for uh, technology-related fields? Mm. Like, uh, are they staffing up in those areas or not? That's or a great question. You know, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know <laughs> the answer to that, but I will look it up. All right, folks. You've been a great audience. Very great. Thank you. I mean, you know, we, well, I mean, we knew that was the case. Obviously, you know, we, we weren't going to release those records, right? We wanted to do a demonstration to show people the need to actually protect the records. But yeah, they just, you know, they, they, they just give them to you.